So I guess uh, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so thanks to everyone uh, for coming. Uh, I am happy to introduce uh, Ryan Hardy, uh, and he's going to be talking on the moral field of environmental engineers in the late 20th century United States. Um, so Ryan is completing his PhD in the history of science and technology at Johns Hopkins University. Um, he also holds a master's in electrical engineering from Johns Hopkins University. Um, and his work focuses broadly on interdisciplinary collaborations in recent engineering fields. Uh, but his dissertation project currently is on, focusing on water quality management in the U.S. since 1945 and how experts defined, monitored, and modeled water pollution on behalf of state, regional, and federal agencies. And um, he has published on Ruth Myrtle Patrick's ecological program at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia in the Journal of the History of Biology. So uh, please join me in welcoming Ryan Hardy. Thanks for being here. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, thank you for having me here, and especially thank you to my dear friend, Dr. Domenico Romani, for her work in organizing this talk. I'd like to share with you a product, or rather a puzzle, from my dissertation research on water quality and the origins of environmental engineering in the US. I'll propose a certain way of thinking about experts of the past that invites us to ask new questions. I'm eager to hear your feedback, so let me begin. In 2019, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published a consensus report titled Environmental Engineering for the 21st Century, Addressing Grand Challenges. The report identified five broad and interconnected challenges that need to be addressed to ensure that people and ecosystems thrive. The committee, consisting mostly of civil and environmental engineers, argued that members of their discipline are uniquely equipped to simultaneously address five challenges. To sustainably supply populations with food, water, and energy. To mitigate climate change. To reduce pollution and waste. To design smart cities. And to foster informed decisions about our shared environments. No other discipline, they implied, could claim such breadth of expertise. Past documents have anticipated this portrayal of environmental engineering. In 1990, David Hendricks and Robert Bowman reflected on the last 25 years since the founding of the Association of Environmental Engineering Professors in 1965. They wrote, the charter given us by the name environmental engineering carries with it a scope which exceeds by far our roots in traditional sanitary engineering. We took the name but have yet to expand our vision and our agenda to fulfill the promise of this designation. Leadership is needed to set a course for solving the global problems which loom and threaten the planet as we know it and mankind. These statements are surprising given that environmental engineering is a relatively small and unknown field. How did it become so essential, so imbued with the social and moral authority needed to confront these grand challenges? Even if we acknowledge uh, historian Amy Slayton's argument, that the engineering grand challenges are devised by engineers in a way so that their expertise will appear essential by design, we still might ask why it is that environmental engineering, among all the other so-called STEM fields, comes out ahead of the pack. What is the relationship between these engineers and the environment, or even environmentalism, a term and a movement we often associate with changes in American society during the social movements? of the late 1960s and early 1970s. As Hendricks and Bowman illustrate, environmental engineers tend to trace their origins to sanitary engineering. In the mid-1960s, a group of them renamed and redesigned their traditional discipline. Sanitary, they argued, had become stale. Although they had considered other adjectives, they settled on environmental because the keyword implied a broadening expertise. But this explanation of the origins of their new name barely helps us understand the various ways that engineers encountered the new category of the environment that emerged in the decades after the Second World War. The relationship between engineers and the environmental movement in the US is extremely complex, and I don't propose to say much about it here. But I will emphasize that an intellectual history of environmental engineering is not only possible and of scholarly interest, 
but can also shed light on the discipline's current authority within the National Academies. Since the 1960s, environmental engineers have made arguments about the promises and pitfalls of technology, pollution, about marginalized communities, non-human nature, public health, sustainability, and risk, infusing their moral thinking into their teaching, writing, research, and career decisions. In this talk, I'll explore how environmental engineers of the 1960s and 70s dealt with environmental concerns in ways that differed both from other engineering disciplines and from an older generation of sanitary engineers. I emphasize that their moral thinking was much more complicated than previous histories have suggested. Using brief case studies, I reconstruct these engineers' moral field to use a metaphor promoted by historian Jan Goldstein in 2015, which refers to the set of normatively charged considerations derived from diverse sources and ambient rather than codified that seem to have guided a particular group of historical actors. I will explore how engineers prioritize some moral claims over others as more compatible with their engineering worldview. My talk is organized into three parts. I'll begin by explaining Goldstein's metaphor of the moral field. Then, using two examples, I'll summarize some of the guiding ideals of sanitary engineers during the 1950s and early 1960s. Third, I'll analyze a group of engineers at Stanford to suggest how the moral field of environmental engineers had changed by the 1970s, due in part to their engagement with the new category of the environment. Jan Goldstein introduced the moral field metaphor as part of her presidential address to the American Historical Association in 2015, summarizing her latest research on racial theorists in mid-19th century France. Goldstein had noticed that the conversation among historians had languished along the extremes of, on the one hand, a blanket condemnation of all the contributors to this intellectual trend that had reprehensible consequences, and on the other, a hands-off stance maintaining that moral criteria shift over time and should not concern us, per se, as historians. She argued that between these two extremes, there is a specifically historical level of analysis that she called the empirical history of moral thinking, thinking as practice rather than thought as product. Goldstein concluded for her own set of actors that the limited number of considerations available to them, her actors, in the moral field of their day, as in the moral field of any day, constrained them. At the same time, they were free to plot their own pathways through the moral field, engaging with the considerations that arrested them. By approaching her intellectuals through the device of the moral field, Goldstein felt that she had, quote, acquired a language to describe their moral choices from the inside out. We begin to grasp the particular logics of individuals' moral worlds. Well, how does the moral field metaphor help us understand environmental engineers in their historical context? As I've already hinted, intellectual histories of engineers and engineering are rare indeed, and the moral field invites someone as bold or naive as myself to attempt them. The metaphor could provide a generative middle path between the two, the twin perils of blanket condemnation and hands-off stance that Goldstein has sensed in discussions of her own historical actors. Researchers in the interdisciplinary field of engineering studies have already suggested that such a middle path is badly needed. For example, in her recent book, Extracting Accountability, anthropologist Jessica Smith of the Colorado School of Mines points out that black and white ethical judgments of engineers are still quite common in the social sciences. Yet, they only hinder us from understanding how the very ethical commitments held by engineers nonetheless can help sustain the corporate forms they struggle within and against. And in her case, she was studying petroleum engineers. Engineering has played an immense role in causing our current environmental crises. And as the National Academies report suggests, some engineers will surely play some kind of role in resolving those crises. For this reason alone, getting a clearer sense of engineering as a tradition, indeed as a global phenomenon, is something we should all care about. 
By studying the moral field of engineers, we come to a greater understanding of engineering. We can identify historical patterns, thereby discerning what has changed over the past yeah, several decades from what hasn't. So if you grant that the moral field of engineers is something to care about, the next question to ask is, what values, ideals, concerns, or even lines of force, to extend the metaphor, as Jan Goldstein did, have given the field its structure? There were many, but I suggest that we start with four. The first three are inspired by philosopher Carl Mitchum, also of the Colorado School of Mines, who proposed three chronological but overlapping ideals that have shaped engineers' moral thinking over time. Obedience to authority and company loyalty, technocratic efficiency, and public health, safety, and welfare. The first two of these should be slightly modified for sanitary and environmental engineers, who seldom had corporate employers and who cared less about efficiency than, say, mechanical engineers of the early 20th century. For understanding engineers' particular environmental concerns, I would suggest we consider their concern for mediation, or in other words, finding balance between competing interests, their techno-optimism, or the belief that science, mathematics, technology, and management can be harnessed to improve human environments, and their concern for the common welfare. I would add a fourth, a concern for future outcomes, because engineers, to varying degrees, did attend to the consequences of their designs. In sum, this metaphor of a moral field, once supplemented by Mitchum's ideals, is useful for three reasons. First, it encourages us to view environmental engineers as simultaneously constrained and creative in their moral encounters with the new category of the environment. Second, it can render the moral itinerary of environmental engineers as intelligible which is to say replete with dilemmas, blindnesses, and structural constraints, stemming from their own choices and from the limitations of the field itself. Finally, it encourages close historical analysis to add complexity and nuance to the representation of environmental engineers we see in documents like the National Academy's report. The next two parts of my talk will test these ideas through a set of case studies. So how might we begin to reconstruct the moral field of post-war sanitary engineers around the time that the term environment was beginning to circulate? We might start by considering their most pressing problem in the first post-war decade. Water pollution was being discussed across the United States, from local newspapers and fishing magazines to congressional hearings. At the same time, however, there was a general climate of distrust for federal regulation of industrial pollution. In such a context, sanitary engineers, many of whom served in state health departments and regional water agencies, were caught in the middle between uncooperative industries and municipalities on the one hand, and an increasing array of activist groups on the other. Clarence Classen was one such engineer, caught in the middle of freshwater politics. He was chief sanitary engineer for the Illinois Department of Health from 1935 to 1970 then directed the state's Environmental Protection Agency for half a year in 1971, before being forced to retire from public service because of disagreements with the state attorney general and his deputy over the proper approach to environmental management. As a civil servant, Klassen inherited a difficult situation when the state created its Agency for Water Pollution Control in 1929. It was composed of directors from state departments of public works, public health, conservation, and agriculture, and also included representatives from industry and municipal health boards. Much of Klassen's career was devoted to balancing these different interest groups by defining and enforcing standards, investigating complaints, and issuing construction permits. Often he would issue a report to the governor, who would then decide on what to do with it. He described his work as apolitical. Quote, I would give the governor a technical opinion based purely on the engineering facts, never attempting to shade it politically. Engineers of Klassen's generation who served state governments often thought of their engineering approach as the key to me mediating between these competing interest groups. Klassen's forced retirement in 1971 
caused by disagreements with the state's lawyers, illustrates how he defined his role as an engineer. Interviewed a decade later, he stated that these state-appointed lawyers were criticizing me for not bringing more people into court. I am an engineer, he described, and our records show that by conciliation, we have a number of waste treatment plants built and operated. He continued, the yardstick they want me to use for success is to file lawsuits. That is not the way to do it. I don't believe in it. History will show that's not the way to get a job done because when you get into court, they can delay. His skepticism in using courts underpinned his mediating or conciliatory approach to polluting industries. It would be too simple, however, to conclude from this that Klassen was pro-industry or anti-regulation. He may even have considered himself an environmentalist, as he was sympathetic to the growing discourse on the environment. When I started, he said, you couldn't get anybody to talk about environment. Now you can get them to be quiet about it, which is a good sign. Edward Cleary was another engineer of Klassen's generation who mediated between different water users as he managed the Interstate Water Commission, or SANCO, from its headquarters in Cincinnati from 1948 until he retired in 1971. He directed Orsanko, he recalled, because he couldn't resist the novelty and challenge of becoming involved with the Ohio, what he called the Ohio River Valley exp uh, Experiment in Regional Cooperation. One of his major efforts at Orsanko was to design, install, and maintain an extensive monitoring network across the Ohio River watershed, using state-of-the-art instrumentation to measure physical and chemical properties of water quality, such as pH, temperature, conductance, or dissolved oxygen. His robots, which housed these measuring instruments, were linked together using existing telegraph lines, and their data were processed and stored in new IBM computers. Cleary believed that by using emerging technologies, engineers could monitor and eventually reduce the pollution that plagued the region. He also organized conferences and meetings between different industrial and municipal managers whose factories and plants were affecting each other's uses of water. His work helped stimulate the creation of new sewage treatment plants across the Ohio River Valley. Yet he was far better at motivating municipalities to install these plants than he was at convincing industries to spend money on new treatment processes. In 1971, the year he retired, one of Cleary's employees, Lewis Williams, criticized the director's misplaced zeal in developing a monitoring network that failed to address industrial wastes. In the end, Cleary's optimism, according to Williams, did not serve the people of the Ohio River Valley. So what do these two examples tell us about the moral field of environmental engineers? Historian Terence Kehoe has characterized this period before the Clean Water Act of 1972 by its spirit of informal cooperation between local governments and polluting industries. Industries were viewed by most engineers of clearing Klassen's generation as good for society. Industrial production helped immensely in the war effort, and many sanitary engineers of that generation had served the military as either health officers or soldiers. Had they chosen a different path, sanitary engineers could have ended up in industry. So they shared a sense of camaraderie across the profession. Importantly, they shared their techno-optimism. Industry's pollution problems, they believed, could be solved through creativity, compromise, and disciplined engineering management, rather than through lawsuits. And they could be solved through an organized local efforts, rather than through federal regulation. We've seen the examples of Klassen and Cleary, a desire to mediate between interest groups by coming up with solutions such as new policies, new teams of experts, or new monitoring networks that exploited advances in electronics and communications. But we also see less explicit concern for the consequences of their approach, as well as an assumption that, as civil servants, they were already serving the public health and welfare well enough. Both Klassen and Cleary later bemoaned what they viewed as the politicization of their field. Klassen warned young people not to become environmental engineers in 1981 because they would fail to be hired or to advance in their field. In 
and he thought that careers in government like his own were no longer suitable for engineers. Yet both had earlier described a fascination with engineering as a profession, as well as a commitment to the environment. So beyond these examples of two civil servants, some of the earliest encounters of engineers with the new category of the environment occurred, occurred in universities. In 1961, a new course was offered at Stanford called Man and His Environment. It was designed by Rolf Eliasson, a sanitary engineer of the same generation as Cleary and Klassen. His course was centered around the application of scientific and engineering principles to the control of the air, water, land, environment for the health and welfare of mankind. Eliasson emphasized how scientific expertise could be mobilized, indeed was already being mobilized, to create healthier human environments despite the pollution of skies and streams across the United States. For example, he brought students to his Palo Alto pilot plant to demonstrate how water treatment worked. The field trip continued until the class became unmanageably large by the late 1960s, with typical enrollments of over 300 undergrads. <coughs> with his course, Eliasson aimed to demonstrate how technology could address the perceived crises of the environment, from water and air pollution to urban housing. In January 1970, an interview with L. Eisen was published in the Stanford Daily, in which he described his optimism about the future. As examples of environmental engineering successes, he mentioned his own work on the reuse of wastewater, the promise of clean nuclear energy, and the benefits of trash incinerators. The article ended with a quote he used frequently to sum up his philosophy, public health is purchasable at a price. This interview underscored Eliasson's strong techno-optimism and his particular kind of concern for the common welfare. Namely, that engineers were capable of managing the problems of society if only they were given the proper political mandate and necessary funding to implement their solutions. Eliasson's views were similar to a group of politically moderate scientists and engineers that the historian Cyrus Modi has dubbed the squares, who had, quote, little sympathy for the counterculture, and yet were open to, even eager for, a new kind of science oriented to the same problems activists said they wanted science to solve. Pollution, mass transit, housing, biomedicine, disability technologies, pedagogical machines, etc. Eliasson's interview was criticized in the next week's newsletter by a PhD student in biology. The student rebuked Eliasson as a false prophet who held the mistaken belief that Cold War technologies such as nuclear power plants and trash incinerators caused no harm. He also criticized the Daily for referring to Eliasson as an ecologist rather than an engineer, responding, Rolf Eliasson is no ecologist. He is a technocrat of the first order, a representative of the strongest anti-ecology force in the world today, the corporate technocratic government complex that defines the goals and priorities of American society. The following week, two graduate students wrote in Eliasson's defense that he was no technocrat, but rather someone aware of the, needs, uh, the need for trade-offs, especially when it comes to energy and wastes. A third civil engineering graduate student again intervened the week after, calling for unity and drawing attention away from the environmental engineer as an enemy and toward what he called the overriding problem of overpopulation and the need for new lifestyles. So, Eliasson's course, Man and His Environment, may seem basic today, but at the time it inspired great zeal. One of its main proponents was Gilbert Masters, who had received his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford in 1966. Upon graduating, Masters worked for Fairchild Semiconductor, but left within two years after he became disillusioned by the Vietnam War. He traveled the country in an improvised Volkswagen bus, joined demonstrations back at Stanford to ban classified engineering research on campus, and audited courses in environmental engineering. By 1971, he had published a textbook titled Environmental Science and Technology that summarized engineering knowledge about pollution, energy, and ecology for students and policymakers. He believed that even though environmental awareness had grown in recent years, 
To convert that awareness into action requires a more quantitative <coughs> understanding of our environmental problems. After Eliasson retired in 1974, Masters began teaching Man and His Environment to the hundreds of Stanford undergraduates. We can distinguish Masters from his senior colleague by con considering a book he co-authored in 1975 with three other Stanford environmental engineers titled Other Homes and Garbage. It, pro it promoted many different techniques for where and how to build your home, how to supply it with heat and energy, and how to maintain local sources of water and food, all for more self-sufficient, low-impact lifestyles. The book clearly expressed the author's techno-optimism and their concern for future outcomes, partly due to their academic positions and partly due to the anti-war rhetoric of the military, uh, about the military-industrial complex. They were less interested in, in industrial mediation and less loyal to the engineering profession as a whole. They also made few assumptions about the engineers' concern for the common welfare. In fact, they described their more libertarian philosophy within the book's first pages, arguing that, quote, it is inherent in human nature to want to be self-sufficient and self-reliant. Modern society has removed many of the opportunities for self-reliance by burying in technological jargon and terminology much of the information needed by non-technical people for development of intelligible choices. We are here trying to remove many of the artificial barriers which can deter you from designing your own methane digester, solar heater, or whatever. What we cannot remove is your expense of time and energy to acquire the necessary information for alternative choices. The Vietnam War likely destroyed the other author's faith in government as it had masters, but none of them sympathized with the 1970s anti-technology counterculture. They distanced themselves from that culture through their technical knowledge and optimism. They were, for example, optimists about the history of science as, quote, a story of extraordinary success. Yet this is not necessarily a fashionable, fashionable view, they said. It is more usual these days amongst the counterculture youth, to say that science, technology, and design have failed. In part, this view stems from a weakness of the historical imagination. Yet they did acknowledge that the criticism was based on demonstrable failures of technology, even if they didn't specify what those were. From the topic of past design failures, they pivoted to a discussion that showed their concern for future outcomes. Designers are human and there are very severe limitations on our capacity to imagine many factors simultaneously, they wrote. For this reason, they promoted self-sufficiency over the hope described by Eliasson in large-scale, centralized, and government-backed solutions to environmental problems. We want to encourage you to become your own design, designer, they concluded. That masters could publish such different books within a year the one promoting environmental knowledge among policymakers, the other targeting a growing group of people who, like himself, pursued alternative lifestyles, demonstrates not only the variety of his environmental concerns, but also his techno-optimism. Unlike earlier examples, Masters and his co-authors were more sensitive to the contingencies of design, the use and misuse of technologies for specific purposes. In writing Other Homes and Garbage, they characterize design as inherently moral. Design is always fundamentally both ethical and aesthetic. So from these case studies, I want to draw a few conclusions. First, I acknowledge that the moral field of, en of engineers is extremely complex, dependent on, upon a variety of factors that I have not dealt with here. The cases I've selected can be explored in much greater depth. Yet I emphasize the prevalence of the four ideals outlined here and their combined effect on engineers' moral thinking, as illustrated through the four examples. These ideals might help explain how environmental engineers establish the moral authority implied by the National Academy's report I opened with. Second, you might have noticed that the engineers I've chosen showed no special concern for marginalized groups or for non-human life. Such concerns only became more explicit later, in the 1980s. Their idea of the common welfare was broad and utilitarian, leveling differences of race, class, and region. 
Nor did their concept of water quality, for instance, show special concern for the fate of aquatic organisms. The moral field of environmental engineers, as far as its dynamics can be traced through written sources, involved aspects of common welfare that were stressed and some that were sidelined, and this changed over time. Goldstein put this point well. The moral field also captures process, she, she wrote. It na it's navigation by individual thinkers, their gravitation to certain lines of force and indifference to others, reveals the field's inherent dynamism and its continually changing shape. That dynamism derives as well from the way the lines of force affect one another when combined by the thinkers in the field. And third, the concept of a moral field can be useful for studying the thought of any range of actors. I don't mean to imply here that engineers are somehow special actors. It may be particularly useful, however, in understanding those group of actors like engineers or even economists to whom we tend to attribute narrow concerns, narrow disciplinary concerns, such as, uh, or, or even corporate loyalty, faith in their models, obsession with technological or economic growth. The moral field encourages us to approach such disciplines analytically. That is without moralizing, by searching for nuance, tension, and change in their moral field. Such complexity in our case arose from the competing ideals of engineers, <coughs> who were both creative and constrained in their engagement with the new category of the environment. Thank you. So you mentioned economists at the end of your talk, and I was just wondering if you saw any like evidence or um, like signs of how economic thinking might have influenced the view of welfare <coughs> that the engineers took. Yes, um, I um, I don't know much about it, but I, I can reference a good book that I think discusses this. It's by uh, Marion Forcati. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, it's French. Um, but she has written a history of economists, and she does mention engineers there. So she's, she's interested in the sort of relationship between those two uh, professions. Yeah. Uh, this is going to reveal that I'm a philosopher. <laughs> the notion of a moral field intrigues me, but I, I guess I want to press on it conceptually. It sounds like in order to do explanatory work, it has to be from the point of view of the agents in question. What are the values that they understand to be animating them? Um, but if we look at you know, analyses of something like false consciousness or something like that, right? there's an equally historically sensitive conception of a moral field that makes reference to not judging from our current point of view, but explaining what is in fact motivating people, even if, say, ideology or other forces cause them to see their motivations as arising quite differently. So the notion of a moral field, even if we insist on situating it in the times and lives of the people affected, could be read in at least those two different ways, right? Um, factively, or what is in fact the... Um, explanatory moral framework that they were sensitive to versus what did they understand themselves as being sensitive to. So I'm wondering which of those you think is going on or do you need to be able to sort of mix and match as it were? So I might... Uh... <coughs> display my ignorance of this concept of the false consciousness. Um, but I think, you know, looking at this group of actors, the first question that comes to mind is, what are they, what are they reading? What kinds of um, ethical ideas are they getting? 
the utilitarian? Are they reading classic books about utilitarianism? If not, how can we look at them as, an, as utilitarians? Which some people have argued that engineers have a very strong utilitarian sort of um, uh, ethic baked into their sort of uh, their, their field. I'm interested in what they read, and that's extremely difficult to reproduce. This is a time period when every one of the examples I used, e each of the case studies, these are people who uh, were affected by the environmental movement. So they were reading, and they were at least aware of books by Rachel Carson, um, Leopold, right? How does that translate to what they're saying and what, is, what it is that they're um, promoting in their in their writing or in their teaching. Um, that's kind of where what I'm interested in in understanding the relationship between maybe maybe you were thinking of sort of that there are of course there are philosophers there are environmental philosophers at this time, but how do they affect the field of engineering? I don't think that's very well understood. It could be separate separate discussions, right? So the moral field metaphor, I find it useful because it gets you to think about the actors, right, as you said so nicely, right in sort of where they're at, what they're perceiving, and then how that sort of affects the decisions they make. Just to clarify, I think you might be giving me too much credit. <clears throat> I have in mind just simple-minded like Marxist analyses of false consciousness, where people are encouraged to think of themselves as, say, religiously motivated. But those religious values are, at least for an orthodox Marxist, to be explained in terms of class structure and whose interests are in fact benefited by these values. So there's a gap between, on this kind of simple analysis, what the actual motivations are and what people are systematically encouraged to think of their motivations as being. That's the kind of... I think, I think yeah, I think I get it better. Okay, so, <coughs> so I think I, I would stress the empirical part of this, that we first need to understand what it is that they're saying before I think I would even be able to start to answer these kinds of questions that you're asking. Um, but even just being able to understand or even explain a bit what their changing morals were is extremely complicated. Um, I think there's been a tendency in literature, like I, like I mentioned, either sort of conflating all engineers together and then not really caring about how their thought is related to their practice. and some of the environmental engineers' own pronouncements that they're sort of um, they're sort of part of the environmental movement, and we can see there. I can I think the case studies bring out there are tensions between what say someone like Rachel Carson is saying and what the engineers I I, I use as examples are actually doing. Um, there's a tension there. So those are the two sort of extremes I would like to avoid, and I'm trying to find my way through that. Um, and this, this metaphor is useful to, to, to show that I think this is possible. Yeah, it's really, because it's one thing empirically to establish whether they read Rachel Carson, and quite another to ascertain how they read her, right. and whether she was taken seriously, or so. Right, right. Um, I'm going to insert myself here, because I have, a, I have a related question. Um, so I was wondering how uh, kind of what you're doing and your project relates to um, I'm thinking about how like discipline, like disciplinary culture, um, and how you know because you're you're focusing on these case studies, and I was wondering if this relates to, uh, or if you have any thoughts on whether and how uh, you know environmental engineers in this period uh, viewed their their kind of profession, like how the profession or how that uh, profession self represents as, or or if they had like a particular kind of moral culture or standards like as a kind of discipline in that time period um, and, and how that relates also to how they were publicly viewed maybe as a discipline. Um, so I just, I don't know, these are, I think there are a couple of questions in there, but I think that uh, there's there's just a kind of interest that I have about like disciplines of how they self-represent. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you have any thoughts about that. I have, I have a couple of thoughts about that. So. I think that histories of engineers, the relationship between engineers and ethics has been, in some ways, I think, slowed down or stymied by focusing on their codes of ethics, 
which is a great way to go, that's fine. But it's limited because the code of ethics don't change that often, they're quite conservative. Um, but this is an extremely important way of how they self-represent. And there have been people who have written just about the code of ethics that, that don't really bring in these, um, these, ideal, these Mitchum's ideals as much. Um, the public welfare one does come in, for example, the um, American Society of Civil Engineers, but that is quite later than you would expect. Their early codes of ethics in the 1930s, 40s, focuses more on um, their obligations to their clients. Mm. And this is important for their discipline, but it doesn't quite get to their sort of moral thinking, um, which I think, uh, I mean, is something that is still such a, it's a, such an open field that I'm only able to really just propose this method and just start to scratch the surface. Um, but it is a methodology that I'm um, con really considering using as I write my dissertation. Yeah, I, just to follow up on that a little bit, um, just a question about uh, something that you said where you know you have these kind of official codes of ethics that are published by uh, bodies that are sort of seen as as uh, important bodies for what you know various types of engineering. Um, does it? It sounds like you're saying that there's in some sense a little bit of a backward looking. Uh, or, or they're like a little bit behind. So you, you, what you're doing is more looking at some of these case studies uh, in order to kind of see how individual engineers were kind of thinking of their own work, um, which then maybe later gets codified in a more kind of official, documented kind of way. Um, is that is that something that maybe? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think... Um... It doesn't really reach, I think the moral thinking of these, of these individuals doesn't really reach the level of the code of ethics ever. Um, but it does help to explain why people like Ed Cleary like, devoted his entire life to doing uh, this thing when he didn't have to do that, right? Like, um, he didn't have to, un unlike Klassen, who was a public servant, he decided to become director of this, uh, this interstate water agency, and he was very instrumental in it. Um, and it, it begs the question of like, what is driving somebody like that, right? Um, I think he might have been one of the original uh, historic figures that, that made me think about this concept of, you know, because it's so um, putting together this, this robot monitoring system that he put together. It took a lot of work and like, um, it, it was pretty, it was unique as well. Um, so. Yeah, there's a, there's a detachment between the code of ethics, and I think it especially works better. The code of ethics might play more into those uh, first two examples. The thing about um, Gilbert Masters, for example, is that he and his co-authors are really in the middle. They're still young during the environmental movement, so they're 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 not really thinking about code of ethics as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. They're motivated by other things. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's sort of a I start to wonder like how useful really is it to look at codes of ethics to understand engineers, and that's kind of what I meant by a bit of a, there's a dead end there in some ways. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm seeing, so uh, just in the gentleman in the back. So you, you pointed out a really interesting evolution in the thinking of these individuals across these case studies from kind of one generation to the next, from you know the 50s into the 60s and early 70s. Yet at the beginning of your talk, you referenced a much more recent NRC Report and what I'm wondering is, do you see this period that your case studies focus on as a particularly important crux or turning point that is still now uh, influencing and, and kind of uh, governing? That's not the right word, but but influencing the practice of engineering to this day. Or do you think that the moral field of these things have continued to evolve and and is it drastically different now? I know it, it gets challenging to make definitive historical statements about things in the very recent past, but it, a lot of what you described sounds really quite familiar to those of us who, who aren't engineers but interact with engineers all the time <clears throat> to this day around issues of environmental sustainability and things like that. Yeah, so you just said, I mean, uh, there's a piece missing in my, uh, in my talk. I admit that the, the sort of the rise of sustainability in the 80s uh, is not something that I've studied too closely, and it, it would be important to um, to understand fully the, 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 the kind of report that the National Academies is, is, is putting out today. So, but, but by looking at that, 
um, the 1990 document, finding that there's a kind of resonance there, and then thinking about how sanitary engineers. Um, the short answer is yes. I think I think my hypothesis is it's very it's difficult to show this that um, that there's much more continuity here than than what maybe uh, than maybe we'd like to think or we're we're meant to believe by. Um, even by sustainability. The reason why I didn't uh, include sustainability is because I'm not sure it, it really is any different from uh, the kinds of things that uh, these engineers were interested in at the time. I mean, it's changed slightly, but I think these ideals are pretty durable. Um, but I'm considering whether, you know, is sustainability different or not? That's something I'm still working on. Although I think my dissertation won't go past the 90s. Things get really much more difficult to trace and I have to make sure I keep things uh yes. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, hi. Um I was wondering about um I think it was Classen he described as he described himself or as apolitical um and kind of if you could go in more detail about you know what you think because I I do think that like rings true to me about kind of how engineers like might view themselves, especially ones who aren't professors and rather like working in the field um like what what do you think that like means when an engineer says like oh my work is apolitical right right yeah um what do i think it means i mean i try to stay out of it a little bit um but i think it, it's a known in, in my field of history of science and technology you know it's 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 sort of a um, an assumption that you know that all historical actors are political, you know, that just by being. Um, so, so it is, it, it's kind of still a problem, I think, even maybe a problem between a history of science and, and, and practicing scientists, that they differ on this point. Um, because uh, at the same time, I think just, just even that, um, that motivation to be apolitical, right, that will have consequences. And I think mediation brings it out. Trying to balance different interest groups without looking like an interest group. Um, but that, yeah, that whether that's possible or not, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say I, I take Klassen at his word. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it's important that he thought that. I think that helps us understand why he did what he did. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. I actually have a follow-up on that point, too, because I, I, I fly back whenever I listen to the talk as well. And do you, I mean, do you have a sense of what he maybe thought, what he meant when he said that he was apolitical? Is it just ha more of this kind of mediator role, or um, or did he have in mind something something more specific? Um, what do you think he was thinking? That's a good question. So I don't think he would put it in terms of mediation. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a, a way that these engineers understood themselves as applied scientists, and so they were, they were drawing upon the apoliticized nature of the science, which was also an issue. Engineers didn't seem as political because, like the, for instance, the Army Corps of Engineers were doing all sorts of projects that had all sorts of political ramifications. So it's harder, it was harder for engineers to, I think, argue that, but, um, but by drawing on the identity of the scientist, uh, that allowed them to, I think. So it could be, for him, it would be derivative of the, apol the apolitical nature of, saying, uh, a pure scientist, mm -hmm. um, someone who's studying, um, and then, and yeah, something, somebody who's studying in a laboratory um, and who's motivated by the scientific virtues, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, the optimism was a thread throughout all of these case studies, right? And I, I think, like, in modern environmental ethics, you might hear arguments to the effect of, like, this sort of optimism can be problematic in certain ways because it, it leaves you blind to some of the effects that are happening in the world, or if you're too, op too much of an optimist about, like, climate change, maybe you put off addressing climate change until the very last second because you're going to rely on some hopeful technology that's going to arise or something. Um, and I guess I just wanted to hear your thoughts on 
whether these people in these case studies maybe saw the potential problems with optimism or if they were completely blind to it and if like if you see maybe like that interaction between environmental ethics and engineering like increasing in some way so that maybe engineers can see the potential problems of this sort of optimism that they take to their approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, a hard question. I think the best example, it's hard, it's hard overall question, but in the case of Gilbert Masters, um, his leaving the electrical engineering field, I think, uh, and there are other cases of, if you look at, I've looked at maybe around 100 people who have gone into the field of environmental engineering in the 70s, um, not exactly knowing their motives, but kind of getting a sense. Gilbert is one of um, one of a handful who who really had a crisis of engineering, and they started in a different field. And they found something in environmental engineering that was a different kind of techno-optimism, right? It's been very hard to um, to really put a pin on what that is, but using technologies um, and using science and technology to, to somehow uh, undo the crises caused by other fields, like electrical engineering or chemical engineering. It's never explicit, but I think the camaraderie that you would find in like the earlier cases does start to change a bit, and environmental engineers start to look kind of different. Um, but that could be on its way to sort of answering your question in terms of there, there are different kinds of technology. There are different kinds of uses of technology. The, the word technology is such a, a tough, it doesn't, you know, it's often, we often just think of it as computers, right? But it's really just tools, right? Um, so it's very flexible. And I think environmental engineers um, appreciated that fact of flexibility and it enabled them to stay optimistic. And that helps, thank you. Maybe just one more question, if there's anybody that's been holding back. All right, otherwise, um, let's go ahead and just thank Ryan again.